Do you want to learn how to play Battletech in 15 minutes? Here's how. In this video, I'm going to run through the rules of classic Battletech. Phase by phase. We're going to keep it simple though. Just mechs here, so no messing about. Let's go. First up, you're going to need somewhere to play. A normal dining table is fine. And the size doesn't really matter too much. Unless you're playing absolutely massive games, you're very unlikely to use the whole board anyway. You'll need a tape measure. Yes, no hexes here. Personally, I like hex maps, but not everyone has them. And you don't strictly need them, so we aren't going to use them here. You need some dice. You can get away with just two, but it's easier if you have four colours, and a pair of each colour for it per player. You'll need some mechs. You can start playing 1v1, so just two are strictly needed. And if you don't have them, you can print them. Use cardboard cutouts, proxies, or just about anything else. I would also recommend grabbing a rule book, as you'll need it in the future. You can also use this video, obviously. I use the Total Warfare book, but you can also download a stripped down version of the rule books from the website Catalyst Game Labs for free. All the links are down in the description below. If you can also grab a summary sheet from the same website, that'll list all the various tables and modifications that you'll need later in the game. It's really useful as a quick guide. And I refer to it a lot in this video. And lastly, you want a record sheet for each of your mechs. To choose which mech, I would head to the website Master Unit List, or grab the PDF Battletech Record Sheets Succession Years. Again, all of this is linked in the description below. This will give you loads of options for popular mechs. When you're setting up your game, choose your force by battle value. You can find this on the record sheet. Similar battle values will be roughly balanced, so it's a really nice way to choose a force. All this data may look scary, but most of it's only relevant when it's relevant. It's all just there so you don't have to flick back and forth to the rulebook all the time. So you've got everything you need. Now, there are a couple of different ways I could have explained this, but I chose to explain the record sheets next. If you think I was wrong, you can skip ahead to the main gameplay and then come back to the record sheets. But for now, let's go. Oh yeah, and if this has been useful so far, make sure you like the video and comment down below. And if you can, share it on some Battletech forums so that other people can find it too. Thanks a lot. So this is a record sheet. It contains all the information you need to know about your mech. The first section is warrior data. Your mech is powered by a person. That person can take real damage and does so because of mech damage and heat. We'll get to that later, but you'll also see a skills section, which contains a gunnery skill, which is how well you shoot, and piloting skill, which is used whenever you do something crazy or dangerous. This next bit is the mech data. Move points are how fast your mech can move. Weight is important if you fall over or if you're hitting things. The era and tech base aren't really relevant straight away, but come into their fore if you're playing more narrative style play later on. The big picture of a mech is called an armor diagram. It looks complicated, but it isn't. The top is the front armor, the middle is the back armor, and the bottom is the internal structure. Pierce the front or back by filling in all the dots, and you hit the internals and can take critical damage. We'll get to that later though. Skipping back to that mech data, you can see the weapons list. Quantity means how many of a weapon you have. The type means what the weapon is. The location means where is it, which is important if you take damage. If you've got a laser in that arm and that arm gets blown off, you've got no laser. Heat is heat, as in how much heat the weapon uses. Damage is how much damage the weapon does. That could be a single number, or if you're firing missiles, a set amount of damage to several areas. If you're under the number referred to in the min column, then you'll incur a penalty when you shoot. To work out if a weapon is firing at long, medium, or short range, you have to be under one of the corresponding numbers on the table. Depending on the range depends on the penalty you'll take when you're firing. The critical hits table we'll cover later in the video, but they basically just go over what damage is done when you start taking really serious damage later in the game. And finally, heat sinks. Heat sinks are how many points of heat you can dissipate at the end of each turn. If you use too much heat, that excess heat goes onto the heat scale, and that list lists all the penalties that'll incur as you accrue more and more heat. Again, we'll go over this later in the video. If all of this is sounding ridiculously complicated, don't panic, it's not. It makes logical sense once you start playing the game. Okay, so that's the groundwork laid out. Now to the gameplay. So a game is made of turns, and each turn is split into phases, during which each player has the chance to move and fire each of their mechs and weapons on the battlefield. The phases are initiative, movement, weapons, heat, and the end phase. It's the same each turn. Initiative decides who moves first. If you lose the initiative, you move first. To decide, 
roll 2d6, and the highest number wins. It's a big advantage moving second, as it allows you to react to your opponent and outmaneuver them. Speaking of manoeuvring, here's the movement phase. Mechs are moved one at a time. The person who lost the initiative goes first, then the other guy, and then back and forth until all the mechs are moved. If one person has more mechs than the other, you continue to move the mechs one at a time until one player has double the mechs of the other. Then the player with double the mechs moves two of his mechs until all the mechs are moved. Confused? Check the table on page 39 in the rulebook to see what I mean, or screenshot it from here. Mechs can move in a few different ways, or not at all. They can walk, run, or sometimes jump. To see how far, look at your record sheet under mech data movement points. We can see our griffin can walk 5, run 8, or jump 5. The faster you move, the harder you are to hit, but the harder it is to hit others too. Unless you are jumping, mechs can only move in straight lines, so that means to go around corners you need to turn. Obviously, a mech's base is a hexagon, so 6 sides. To do a full turn is 360 degrees, which would take 6 turns or six movement points. Most moves are a mix of forward motion and turns. So move two, turn one, move two equals five. In this case, it would be a walk. If I moved one more forward, I would have moved six. So I'd be running. But here, it gets a bit more complicated. It does make sense logically though, so bear with me. How much I move affects how accurate my shooting is. Think of it this way. If you were shooting after a short run and a spin, you would be less accurate than if you just stood still. But if you just span on a spot, while it would be hard for you to be more accurate, it would make you easier to hit. That's accounted for. And we cover how to work it out in the weapons phase. But for now, think of it as the more forward motion you have, the harder you are to hit. When you jump, you can move up to your maximum jump distance in any direction and end up facing in any direction. The reason we don't just jump everywhere is because of heat, which again, we'll cover later. The last thing to go over in the movement phase is terrain. You can get the modifiers for this in the summary card or on page 52 of the rulebook. So your mech is in position. On to phase three, weapons. Technically, there are two phases here, weapons and physical attacks. But the simple rules don't include physical attacks. While I love the idea of two mechs punching and kicking each other to death, to keep things simple, I haven't included them here. You can find them though in the rulebook. As the first part of your weapons phase, to avoid being outflanked, you can do something called a torso twist. That means you turn the top of your mech one hex side to the left or right, which changes your firing arc, which means you might be able to see and fire with guns that you might not have been able to do before. For calculating hits though, it's done on the way you're facing. Next is line of sight. If there's nothing in the way, you have line of sight. If you're in cover, take a gander at the terrain modifiers on page 107 of the rulebook. When you're firing, the player who lost initiative declares why he's firing first. Yes, you have to say what you're firing first before you roll then player 2 declares. Personally, I would write down what you fire, or you may forget if you're firing a lot. Bear in mind, each weapon adds heat. We go over heat later, but as a rule, try to keep inside the number of heat sinks on your mech to avoid trouble. Once you know what you're firing, roll 2d6 to hit. If you hit, you automatically do the damage listed, and roll to see where you're going to hit by rolling 2d6. Once you know, your opponent colours in that damage on his record sheet, and you move on until all the weapons are fired. When you're working out firing, there's various modifiers which come into it. To work out if you hit something, you need to account for how good your pilot is at shooting. That's called your gunnery skill. This is usually 4 unless you've modified it. Then you work out if you walked, ran or jumped. If you walked, it's a 1 modifier. If you ran, it's a 2 modifier. And if you jumped, it's a 3 modifier. Then we work out how many inches or hexes your opponent moved. We only care about forward or backward motion here, not turns. Move 3 to 4, it's a modifier of 1, 5 to 6, 2, 7 to 9, 3, and 10 to 17, 4, and so on. If you or your opponent stay still, then add 0. Work out how far you're away next. Look at your record sheet. If you're short range, add a 0 modifier, medium range, add 2, and long range, add 4. If the weapon you're firing has a minimum range, if you're below that, add 1 for every inch you're below that minimum. Lastly, account for any terrain modifiers. Then just add those numbers together. So the gunnery skill, the attacker's move, the target's move, any others, and range. If that number equals 12 or less, it's possible to hit. Roll 2d6 and test your luck. You hit. 
Hooray! Grab your summary table and let's see where we hit. We're firing from the front here, so we go to our hit location table, roll 2d6, and we roll an 8, which means we hit on the left torso. We fired our PBC, which does 10 damage, so mark down 10 damage onto your left torso by colouring in the dots. If you fired missiles, that's short range or long range, SRMs or LRMs, you need to roll to see how many missiles hit. Use the cluster hits table on the summary sheet. Our Griffin has an LRM 10, so we roll 2d6 and we roll 9, which means that we have 8 missiles which hit. To speed things up a little bit, we divide our damage into groups of 5. 8 missiles doing 1 damage is 8 damage, so that's a 5 and a 3 damage. Then we roll for location twice. First location takes 5 points of damage, the second location takes 3. For short range missiles, it's the same process, but each missile hits a different location. Once you've coloured in all the dots on a point of armour, you then start spilling over damage internally. Every time you do internal damage to a mech, you have to roll for a critical hit. The only other way to score on a critical hit is if you roll double one. To determine if you get a critical hit, consult the table on the summary sheet. If you roll over an eight, you score a critical hit. If you roll over 10, you score two critical hits. And if you score 12, you either blow a limb off or score three crits. Depending on what critical damage is done, the mech can either fall over, heat up, or even detonate. Nice. If all of the armor points are full inside and out, that part of the mech is considered to have been blown off. If it's the head, or the centre torso, your fight is over. If it's one of the top sections, check to see what was there. It may be that your main weapon was there, and therefore you don't have that anymore. Or if it's a leg, you're going to fall over. Keep going with this round until all the weapons that were declared have been fired. It's worth mentioning here that any damage that occurs during this round is applied right at the end, so everybody gets a chance to do damage during a single turn. At the end of the round, if you end up taking serious damage, 20 points or more, being hit in the head or falling over, your pilot is not going to be happy. So you'll need to do a piloting check. Check the pilot skill. You'll be able to use the pilot skill of 5 as a base, apply any modifiers, and roll 2d6. If you pass, you're fine. If not, you fall over. No. The rules for falling are on page 68 to 69. The short version is one point of damage for every 10 tons rounded up. Roll to see where you're facing, and roll another piloting check to see if your pilot is hurt. You mark pilot hits on your record sheet. Are you still with me? If you are, thank you. You might consider subscribing at this point because I have loads more content like this I want to produce in the future. Thanks so much. So we've moved, we've fought, and we've taken damage. The next phase is heat. Blessedly, this phase is relatively simple. You accumulate heat as you move and fire. Your heat sinks dissipate them. Our Griffin has 12 heat sinks. A walk adds one heat, running two, jumping is one for every hex or inch moved, or a minimum of three. Let's say our Griffin ran two. He fired his PPC, which adds 10 heat, that adds to 12 heat. So we're absolutely fine. At the end of the turn, the heat sinks empty away all that heat. If we'd fired his LRM as well, we would have 16 heat. So we can shed 12, but we'd still have four left in our heat scale that do not dissipate. For round one, we're fine, but then we have to make choices in round two. Either we move less, fire less, or start to take penalties. If we do exactly the same again, our heat climbs to eight, and now we can move one less. And we have a plus one to our firing, making it harder to hit. If instead we just fired our LRM, that means we'd only accrued six total heat, so the excess heat, including on the heat scale, can then dissipate. As you take damage, it becomes harder to lose heat. Lose an engine, for example, and you add five to your heat each round, so the game increasingly becomes about managing heat, or killing your opponent really quickly. Now it's the end phase. This phase ties up loose ends, like seeing if you go unconscious, or wake up, and you reset torso twists, etc. Then rinse and repeat until you complete your mission. Game on. There are loads more depths to this game. More combat, more vehicles, more everything. But hopefully this should get you started. I hope you liked this video. If you did, there's loads more Battletech content on YouTube. I'm a big fan of Tech Talks Battletech. But if you like my videos, thank you very much. And you can find them just over there. Thanks so much.